Hello, I'm Paul Pirello, and welcome to the Philly Factor. Located in Burr Home, Ryers Museum visitors can find an extraordinary and eclectic collection that includes a generation of family heirlooms, paintings, sculpture, and decorative art, as well as a vast array of Asian art and artifacts. There's even, get this, a three-foot-tall gold-colored Buddha made out of gilded wood that places out at visitors. That house was originally built, Ryers Museum, the house there, was originally built in 1859 by Joseph Wallen Ryers, who started out in his family's import and trade business before he became president of the Tioga Railroad. Many residents probably see this building um, and pass by it and not quite sure um, what's inside the building there. It's a one-of-a-kind museum that's in that side, inside that building. It's been kept virtually top secret for quite some time, maybe until now. There was an article that I came across in the Philadelphia Inquirer maybe about a year or so ago, and I said, gee, this makes for an interesting Philly Factor program. So here to talk about the Ryers Museum and Library, the mission of Ryers, and some of the programming taking place there, we have Martha Moffat, Site Director for the Ryers Museum and Library, and Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro, Associate Professor of Instruction, Intellectual Heritage Program, Temple <coughs> University. I want to welcome you both to our program. Thank you for So, in reading that article in the Philadelphia Inquirer way back when, it seemed like this was one of the best kept secrets in the borough home section of Philadelphia. Carol, you uh, mentioned that you passed this building on a regular basis and had no idea what Ryers was all about. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, and I knew of the area because this is where everybody went sledding. Okay. And uh, that's, I knew there was a small library branch inside the building. I knew that I had no idea there was a museum. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago when the museum had a fundraising event, and it was a dog event, mm -hmm. and I have a little poodle, and I brought my dog, it was a beautiful day, and I saw a little sign that said, museum. I went, what? <laughs> and I stuck my dog discreetly in a little pouch, and off I went to take, check out the museum. And I was really surprised and very impressed with the kinds of things that the museum had to offer. So could we talk a little bit about the history of the museum before we get into where the museum is today and what we can find when mm -hmm. visiting? So um, maybe, Martha, you could answer uh, the question, is that um, this building has been there for, for decades and years and years and years. Um, how did it get there? Why is it there? Who built it? Who was responsible for Ryers? It was built by Joseph Wall Ryers, and he was a railroad and a shipping tycoon. He built it as a summer home. Mm -hmm. His, their primary residence was in the 900 block of Walnut Street, not far from Washington Square. Mm -hmm. So when he built his summer home, it was farmland all around Burl Home, Fox Chase, uh, he, um, there were almost a hundred acres that, were, that made up this estate that he called Burl Home, which was uh, taken from his ancestors' estate in England. And the Walns were very important to the Ryers and to really the, one of the reasons I believe why the museum was established. We should mention that it was not uncommon for business people in downtown Philadelphia, you said they lived at Ninth and Walnut. Uh, it was not unusual for them to move out to what we would consider the suburbs in some cases. Uh, either they were moving out to the Germantown area, which was nothing like the Germantown of today, or even Borough Home for that matter. So they would, their summer residence would be outside of the city proper, was where all the business was taking place. So they, they built this house for a summer residence to escape all the the heat, the business, and the mess that was downtown Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, well, um, Burl Home sits on top of a hill, and you don't wonder at all when you're sitting on the, the vast front porch that we have because there's always a breeze mm. and a beautiful view of the city of Philadelphia. Really, yeah. Um, Carol, I know you um, 
devoted your sabbatical last year mm -hmm. to really diving in head first mm -hmm. into everything and all Ryers. Mm -hmm. It says a lot about your passion for this project and your passion for um, not only learning yourself about mm -hmm. Ryers, but really trying to get the word out about this museum. Mm -hmm. So um, what made you decide that this is, this is the passion project that you wanted to get involved in? Well, it had a couple of iterations. Uh, I actually, when I had gone initially to look at both the Asian Gallery and the European Gallery, uh, I realized that there are many beautiful objects and almost no signage. Mm. And almost no uh, ability for people to actually know what they were looking at. And when it came to the European Gallery, there's a lot of um, ceramics and decorative arts, and that is not my area. Mm -hmm. I have a doctorate in religion, though, and the Asian Gallery was filled with um, images of deities uh, that were either used for worship or, or in a decorative way. And I realized, well, I can certainly help with this. <laughs> uh, and we had initially thought that this would be a good project for a student to take on. And I realized quickly, after a semester of that student not being able to do a thing, that this is actually a project that a faculty member should take on. So as my uh, sabbatical time period came up, I emailed Martha and I said, hey, you still interested in somebody finding out more about the meaning, the cultural meaning of these objects and the religious significance of these objects? And she said, sure. Mm -hmm. And that became my sabbatical proposal. And I really took about six months. It was the summer and then the following fall that I was able to uh, really work on identifying the objects. Uh, and thinking and learning about their religious and cultural significance. What I find remarkable is that I, I guess many people can understand the, um, uh, the European influence at Ryers, but like when I started out the program talking about this three-foot Buddha statue that looks out over you as you, you know, enter uh, Ryers, how did that Asian influence come to be at Ryers? I think there are two reasons, and one goes back to the Walms, the, the Ryers ancestors who came over with William Penn on the, the ship Lamb. Mm -hmm. The Walms made their fortune through China trade, um, opium, and also ceramics. We have, that have been handed down through the generations, um, things that the Walms collected in China, including wonderful ivories, um, some puppet theater, various other little objects, paintings. So I think that was, that's part of it. The other part goes, speaks to the fascination with the Far East at the time when, just before the museum opened, mm -hmm. um, the Robert, Robert Ryers' his wife, Mary Ann, after he died, she remarried and she went to China two times in Japan and collected probably 90% of what we have in the Asian gallery now. So at that time, it was possible for someone who was more middle class, upper middle class to actually travel mm -hmm. to the Far East. And the mysticism was, uh, was fascinating to yeah. the, in, in that time period. So yeah. those two things. I think are responsible for our Asian gallery today. So tell me then, how do all these artifacts um, on display at Ryers um, go unnoticed uh, for, for all these years? I mean, uh, was there foot traffic? I'm sure, you know, people going by or like Carol driving by, you see it, you pay no attention to it, and then it's an event that sort of draws you in. But so for decades then, these items were there uh, the museum, which I understand it was, it was, I guess, willed that the museum would be free for ad admission. Mm -hmm. So were, you, were they getting a lot of foot traffic? Were they getting any traction? You know, did you have to sign a register? You know, when you walked in and you looked back and, you know, the year 1983, there were maybe 10 people that visited. So I, I'm trying to just understand how this jewel of a, uh, of a prize sat there and really nobody knew perhaps that it existed. Well, that's been one of our major challenges is to get the word out about, about Ryers. We have a small staff, no budget. Mm -hmm. 
we've been doing what we can. When Carol made the offer to help us research the artifacts and figure out the meanings of and the symbolism of what we had in the gallery, we didn't even know, for example, what was Hindu, what was Buddhist, what was Taoist. I mean, we've had things appraised. We basically, we know what we have. Mm -hmm. But trying to interpret it for the public has been uh, really kind of impossible for, sure. <laughs> for someone like me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the other challenge, so getting people in has been what we've been working really hard at. I think what, what we're succeeding at is becoming a community resource, which is what Robert intended. We have, um, we have story time for little children, crafty kids. We host meetings. We had Fox Chase Poets meet at Ryers. We had Borough Home Stamp Club. We do what we can to bring the public in. So we've actually seen our attendance increase. Mm -hmm. For op only open three days each week, we've gone from last year, the year before last, 5,000 people to 6,000 people. So we're working on it. But yes, why is it still? <laughs> A mystery. I guess, the, like so many of our historic resources in Philadelphia, they're hidden gems. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it would seem. I mean, I, I think when you know you talk about you know the buildings that are downtown, you know you you have a um, um, a lock on visitors into Old City. You know they're coming in to see the Liberty Bell, and that's going to spill over into all those other buildings that are around there. You know, Burholm is in a little bit of a hike out the Roosevelt Boulevard up to the you know, Fox Chase area of, of Northeast Philadelphia. Um, uh, but, you know, I, on the other hand, if I lived there and I saw this building and, you know, I would be interested to know what's there. And then once I step inside, I want to know what do all these artifacts mean. And so, Carol, you know, due to your work, we're starting to get an understanding um, about, so uh, the public in general you know, you don't necessarily need to be a resident of that part of the city to come into right. Ryers. If you're, if you have an interest in some of these, you know, pieces of art, they're there on display for you to come in and learn about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What has been the most fascinating part of your research, then, Carol, in trying to understand all these artifacts? Because you know, sometimes you could take a simple ceramic mug and find that it dates back to the 1700s. Um, here you have all these different types of artworks, uh, religious in nature mm -hmm. and, and not. So what has been the most fascinating part of the job for you? Well, that's a really hard one to, to uh, narrow down. Uh, some of the biggest challenges were the conditions of some of the pieces. There are things that tend to disappear. Mm. Uh, for example, you may have a deity with eight arms, and the way that you're able to identify it is by what those hands are holding. And if all of that is gone, then you literally have to look at the position of the hands or some other way of being able to tell. Mm. Uh, there is also oftentimes a conflation uh, uh, Taoist deities and Buddhist deities in China, for example, it could have one statue, but it could actually have double meanings. So that has been a tremendous challenge. Um, I have really, really enjoyed learning about the different stories behind, let's say, one deity. Mm -hmm. You can have five or six different origin stories, five or six different ways of understanding that one statue. And then just very recently, um, the, some of the identifications turned out to be not so, not so great. Um, they turned out even the appraisers made some mistakes. But uh, there was something uh, that I just ran across in a book about Freire, Charles Freire, who uh, is the founder of the materials in the Freire Gallery in Smithsonian, which is an amazing Asian art collection. Sure. And uh, there was a little account about how when he went to Japan. Uh, they, uh, he s was taken to an old temple and the people there, it was actually dealers dressed up like monks 
and he, you know, they're trying to hide their identity, and they're saying, look, everything in here belongs to one temple, and look how old all of this is. And he went home, and he wrote a letter that basically said, no, this was all put on, and I knew that these were eclectic things from all kinds of different places. And he said later he went to the antique shops and saw the same pieces mm -hmm. being, uh, being displayed. And we have, ostensibly, where that three-foot golden Buddha is, that's all supposed to have been purchased in one temple by uh, Marianne, and it was supposed to be dating back to the 13th century. But it's a very ill-assorted, beautiful pieces, but very ill-assorted. They don't seem to have a harmony together. And now, of course, I have to wonder whether, in fact, she fell for what Charles Freer was somehow able to see through. And but that's also an interesting part of the history, though. Oh, absolutely. Of, of, yeah, uh, and each of, of the, the deities is a fascinating story in and of itself. But every time you know, I read something in conjunction, and I will wait a minute. So there's a lot of wait a minute moments. There's a yeah. lot of aha <laughs> moments. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I just sent something to Martha yesterday. I ran into some information about something that I just through different interesting channels that I had no idea about, and I was able to update uh, one of the submissions I had given to her originally. Yeah. I, I mentioned um, before that this is something, whether you live in that part of the city or not, you would be interested in coming in to see. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that there are all of these Asian artifacts, might there be a thrust or a partnership or reaching out to um, communities in the greater Philadelphia area, Asian communities that, um, you know, and I'm sure if you go down into, you know, Chinatown area, there are probably places you could go and see these type of mm -hmm. artifacts. But to me, in a museum setting, you know, short of the Philadelphia Museum of Art or something of that caliber, um, would you consider reaching out, or have you reached out to some of the Asian communities throughout the area to try to either partner with them or say, hey, we would love for you to come in and look and see what we have as yeah. a way to work with them? And actually, there is both a, um, a Chinese Buddhist temple and a Hindu temple in Northeast Philadelphia. And we have some really lovely um, uh, Hindu objects. So it is really on the radar screen. I mean, mm -hmm. the question is uh, when we have time to do that. The other obstacle could be a language barrier with some of the ethnic Buddhist groups. Um, and so we would need maybe somebody to do some translation Perfect. for us and to help the communication. There, uh, some of these uh, temples are founded by recent immigrants. So if we're able to sort of bridge that language gap and make those connections, it would be ideal because this could tell us how some of these uh, uh, statues are used in practice. And it could also be a great check on what I've been able to do. Sure. Um, you know, sometimes it's, I would write to Martha and say, okay, I'm about 90% sure about X, mm -hmm. but boy, you know, uh, that leaves some question and it yeah. would be interesting to have it either verified or no, 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 that's this thing and, and that would be fantastic. Martha, what is the, I guess, the, the, the mission statement then for Ryers? I mean, because here we have this hidden gem in, you know, this part of Northeast Philadelphia you want to get more foot traffic in for people to experience what Ryers is all about, to learn the history behind it, and see some of these wonderful artifacts that have been cultivated there over the years. So really, what is the mission of, of the museum? It's to educate the public about the Ryers and their passion for collecting and, and Victorian life. So mm -hmm. that, that's what we're doing. We actually, there's more to the, the museum than the Asian collection. Yes. We, if you come through the side door, you'll pass by our dog cemetery, complete with tombstones. Really? When you go inside, you'll see oral portraits that were painted of the Ryers dogs. We also have uh, portraits of their other pets, their rabbits, their horses. They were early animal rights advocates. And um, Robert's stepmother, Mary Ann, um, founded a farm for old horses. It's called Ryer's Farm for Aged Equines, and it's still in existence in Pottstown mm. today. She also had a hand in um, founding the Morris Animal Refuge and yep. the Anti-Vivisection Society, so mm. we've got that. Plus we have um, uh, things that were used by the family day to day. So we have furniture, we have ceramics, we have um, we've got a shell collection. <laughs> we have a, a some, actually something for everybody. We we have a rock and mineral collection. 
If you come to Ryers, you will find something that will interest yeah, you. And then there's the European Gallery, which yeah. is yeah. some pretty astounding things. Um, now, there's a great research opportunity there for people who might be interested in Native American artifacts, mm -hmm. European artifacts. Um, and one of my personal favorite items, which I found out was a tradition in, uh, in uh, parts of Europe, it's, it's a crucifixion in a bottle. A crucifixion in a bottle. Yes. Yeah. It is really one of my favorite things because I had no idea such a thing existed. Yeah. And apparently, as people put ships in bottles, yeah. some people put, um, put this material together to represent um, uh, crucifixion, and it has a lot of important Christian symbols all in a bottle. Wow. So it's fascinating what you got there at, at Ryers. I mean, we got to tell the story and we got to get people to come out and, and, and sort of spend the day, or if not the day, just a few hours there. You said it's open three days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, we've put the website up on the screen so people can get further information about uh, the days and the times that the, that the museum is open. Um, and, uh, you know, Ryers is not a name that we, you know, comes to the top of mind consciousness when you talk about Philadelphia history. You talk about the Drexels, the Biddles, you talk about Ben Franklin, George Washington, you talk about, uh, you know, um, some of the, the, the bigger names, you know, the Kelly family. But yet, Ryers does it, and it should resonate to the top, given all the history behind it. So um, part of, you know, I guess the task is getting word out about who the Ryers were, what the museum is about, and what people could experience. Now, there's also a library there, too, <laughs> that is not connected to the free library system of Philadelphia, but our, you know, our neighborhood kids, people, you know, invited to come in and um, browse the library and take out a book or two? Oh gosh, yes. We have a, a wonderful children's library and we have a, a fantastic selection of books for adults. We have current bestsellers. If you go to the Fox Chase branch of the public library, they might not have what just came out, but you'll come to Ryers and most likely we will have it, or we'll get it for you. Mm -hmm. So, and, and some of the, I guess, the, uh, the early books of the Ryers family are also available to see there at, at the library? They're up there in our archives. If you'd like to see one or two of them, we're happy to bring them down. But yeah, when, when um, the library first opened in 1910, the 10,000 books that the Ryers owned were what were borrowed by the people that came to use the library. Mm. So we, we like to think of ourselves as a real community resource. It's a very old fashioned library. We still have a card catalog, <laughs> which <laughs> Imagine that. Are, yeah. You say card, 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 card catalog, catalog, catalog and people are saying like, what's that, a card catalog? Yeah, and yet I remember going to school and going to the main branch and going through the, you know, to find the book that you yeah. needed. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, so that's uh, pretty funny, but you know, <laughs> but it, it's part of the history of of that building in that in that library, yeah. yeah. We still have the tables, the bookshelves, the chairs. It's really a wonder. It has a wonderful feel. Yeah. Um, give me a, like a geographic, you know, snapshot of what is what else is around Ryers. I mean, so if I'm driving down, you know, Burl Home Avenue, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, Cotman Avenue. Cotman Avenue, or whatever, yeah. uh, and I pass it. I mean, is it is it a busy part of? that part of the city? Well, it's in a large park, Burl Home Park, that has ball playing fields. There's Burl Home Family Fun Center that has a driving range and a miniature golf. There's uh, a brand new beautiful playground on in Burl Home Park. Mm -hmm. um, so aside from the museum and the library, there's some really good little restaurants in, in Fox Chase. Mm -hmm. There's an old-fashioned diner, the Mayfair Diner wow, nearby, yeah. so you can have a full-day experience when you come out there. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you're always looking for volunteers. You're always looking for help. Um, you know, many of these organizations, <laughs> you know, like yours, uh, they thrive on the back of volunteers who devote their time and effort, just like you did, Carol, with your sabbatical. Uh, so if people are interested, what type of person might you be looking for to volunteer their time at Ryers? Well, we have... Uh, a small group of volunteers called the Friends of Ryers who put on events to fundraise mm -hmm. to support Ryers Museum and Library. Because Ryers is an unusual place. It's owned entirely by the City of Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. Okay. So um, they support us, capital projects. They're the ones that pay my salary, the staff salary. But we need, we have our friends group that actually does, does fundraising for important projects. So right now they're fundraising 
to uh, conserve the stained glass windows up in the cupola. Mm -hmm. And they've actually fundraised for four windows out of the eight. They're working on the fifth. Mm -hmm. So um, they could absolutely use some volunteers to help sure. with events that they plan, like our Victorian tea that we hold in December. We had 600 people come wow. last year in one day. It's the libraries converted into a tea room. We have uh, craft vendors throughout the museum. Um, Santa Claus comes. We sell greens on the front porch. It's a huge community day. Mm -hmm. um, so that we also use uh, volunteers in our library, and um, occasionally in our muse for museum projects. We also have Love Your Park coming up on May 19th. You can come and help spruce up. The, the area of the park around the museum definitely need volunteers yeah. for that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess there's always a challenge because it is a historic building that you know, uh, you know, just just routine work around the place needs to be, you know, maintained. Whether you, you talked about the windows that are you know being restored, I mean that you know you, it, it takes a special craftsman to do that work, and that's why you need to raise the money to get that right person to to do the work. Yeah. But given the historic nature of the building. Um, you know, it's one of those, you know, those gems that uh, I'm sure all the friends and everybody involved at Ryers are uh, working diligently to make sure that the, the, the integrity of the building inside and out are you know, both maintained the way that it needs to be. Yeah. Yes. That's all right. Well, uh, we've uh, put the, uh, the website up on the screen. So if you're looking for more information about the Ryers Museum and Library, you can uh, follow up there. I want to thank both Martha and Carol for being with us here on this edition of the program. And uh, until the next time, my name is Paul Torello. Thanks so much for being with us here on The Philly Factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.